Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's round off the day with an overview of the highlights of Formnext 2022 in terms of technical innovation. We were able to win an expert for this who can give us a very good assessment with her know-how. What's new in 2022? A summary of the key additive technology innovations at Formnext. Welcome with me on stage, Alex Kingsbury, industry consultant, additive economics, fresh from Australia. Alex, please come to me on stage. Good to have you. Thank you, Sven. Hi everyone, my name's Alex Kingsbury. Um, I've worked in, and apologies, you're gonna have to forgive my voice. It's terrible because it's Friday, of course, of Form Next. So we're all exhausted. Thank you so much for being here with me. Like I said, my name's Alex Kingsbury. Um, I've worked in metal additive for about 10 plus years. Um, also worked across a number of different industrial polymer systems as well. Um, like most of you, I've been doing the rounds of the halls, having the meetings, seeing the booths. And what I'm hoping to give to you today is a bit of a summary of the highlights um, of what I've seen. So um, here we go. I'm not going to have any slides today because I wanted to really come into this with the, the, the freshest impressions that I had. Um, so I thought it would be best if we just, it's just you and me here talking about what I've seen um, at Formnext. So to kick it off, sustainability I thought was a really, really strong theme. We've seen this through the course of the year. Um, I believe it's, it's obviously uh, 3D printing has always had a play in sustainability, um, but this has come through very, very strongly in 2022. Um, in terms of what's driving that, uh, I think it's probably driven by a lot of government regulations, but I think it's probably more driven by companies forecasting and getting ready um, to be able to report on things like environmental, social, and governance metrics, right? That's going to be increasingly important. So um, I've been having a conversation with uh, Sherry Handel from the AMGTA, the Additive Manufacturers, uh, the, the Green Trade Association for Additive Manufacturing. Um, Sherry said to me, show me a 3D printing company and I will show you their sustainability story. It's Sherry's belief that there is a sustainability story for every single exhibitor here on the floor. Um, I think it's really important when we think about 3D printing that we don't greenwash, right? Um, and the way that we avoid that is by doing something called a life cycle assessment. And we've seen a couple of these announcements come out this week um, around doing life cycle assessments. So for example, I'll give you one. Um, 6K uh, has just recently announced with Fraunhofer ILT that they're gonna be doing a sustainability assessment on their process. Um, that's a really interesting company. Uh, they have an atomization technology or a powder production technology. And in titanium, they have actually bought a, a recycler. So they get titanium scrap in. Uh, they can mill it and then they spheroidize it. And you can use that powder uh, in, in metal powder machines, in, in you know, laser powder bed fusion machines, EV machines. Um, that's, it's, a great, it's a great sustainability story. And of course, you just look at that anecdotally and say, well, that sounds very sustainable. It sounds like it has a much lower carbon uh, footprint. But the way that you evaluate that properly is by doing something called a life cycle assessment. So I think it's really great to see that they're going to be doing that with Fraunhofer. Also around sustainability is very interlinked with supply chains, right? So um, we're having a look now very critically across all of our supply chains. Um, I, I think everyone here listening today has experienced, I know everyone here today has experienced supply chain pain in some way, and of course 3D printing um, can come in and address that solution really, really nicely. Uh, we had something called AM Forward announced uh, in the US earlier this year, and that's all about being able to ensure that you have supply within your own country. Why do I mention supply chains, though, with sustainability? They're, in they're interlinked. They're interlinked. Okay, so the, uh, the longer that we're, um, we're going to be sending something, the, 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 the further the distance, the higher the carbon footprint. Um, 3D printing is an amazing technology for being able to address um, supply chain demands and, and squeezes. 
It's also really important for things like national security as well. Um, every country now is going through a process of looking much more internal um, to how they can cater for and be able to produce the things that they need within their own country. Additive manufacturing is an enabling technology and it is a, a perfect technology to be able to address some of these issues that we have around supply chain, sustainability and national security. I mentioned 6K. We also have another company here exhibiting for the first time called Metal Powder Works. Um, similar sort of uh, idea in that you're using a billet um, and it, it could be scrap uh, and you're able to then um, process it to produce powders. Um, it's a, a much lower energy cost to produce those powders than your traditional gas atomization. Um, and they did a life cycle assessment as well. Again, with an independent verified uh, supplier of life cycle assessments. And they found that their process was 90% lower carbon footprint. Okay, so we're starting to see a lot of this sort of um, behavior and talk coming out in the show. Um, it's, it's one thing to, to, like I said, talk the talk, you're going to walk the walk as well. And doing things like engaging with the Green Trade Association, engaging with organizations like Fraunhofer, doing things like life cycle assessments, that becomes really important in order to claim your green credentials and to properly report on your environmental, environmental sustainable, social and governance metrics. We also have... Uh, I guess the issue around metals being, being much more inherently recyclable than polymers, and I think that this is something for the industry to consider more generally, is how we treat our recycling in terms of uh, material supply to part production to then what happens to that part um, at the end of its life. And we can see that we have a much more transparent process or end-to-end -end life for a metal part than we do, generally speaking, for polymer parts. I think this is something that we are still yet to really address properly. Um, I can't say I saw a huge amount of evidence um, about it on the show, but, but, but certainly in the metal space, I feel that this is really progressing very, very well. We did see things like, um, for example, Stratasys put out with N Frontier, um, an e-mobility, uh, bike meets car. Uh, this, this, again, is all about being able to get around in a way that is less carbon intensive. The other thing I noticed, and I'm not sure if you noticed it too, but we tend to have a lot of greenery on the booths. Um, I know that this is a pretty sort of um, just relatively super, superficial thing, um, but it does seem to me to be that a lot of the companies around here are putting a lot of ferns, plants, trees, and so on on their booths in order to just even visually appear. To, to care about environmental impact and sustainability. The other thing that we saw a lot of at the show this week, and we were expecting, of course, because there's been a number of pr uh, press releases leading up to this show, is post-processing. So, um, of course, you know, additive manufacturing has come out of a prototyping technology. Uh, we haven't really been too concerned about post-processing. Um, until probably more recent years. I think it was about 2019 where we saw a huge explosion of providers in the post-processing space. Post-processing, of course, is a big umbrella term. It can include a lot of different, uh, different technologies, anything from heat treating a metal part to inspection um, to removing support structures. Right? So it's a, it's a big area and it's basically everything that happens once the, uh, the part is printed. We've had a couple of interesting companies, though, exhibit in the post-processing space, and I wanted to mention them. Um, Rivalin Ro Robotics was one of the um, startup companies that I believe presented on the stage here this week. So it's pretty simple. Um, they have a robot that removes support structures automatically. Now, you wouldn't think that that's necessarily genius, <laughs> But the, the thing is, is that the solutions that are currently out there are relatively inadequate, quite frankly. And what manufacturers are having to do is really rely on some sort of hodgepodge arrangement to try and do their post-processing. Being able to automate those workflows is becoming increasingly important as manufacturers look to scale production 
and this post-processing element for them becomes a huge pain point. So as a result, we have companies springing up to be able to provide solutions in that space. I think it's interesting that the OEMs aren't taking that upon themselves necessarily to provide post-processing solutions at all. Um, they're really relying on third-party providers. Anyway, there was another company, uh, Solucon. Um, they've, they've exhibited here for a number of years now. Uh, one of the exciting things about Solucon is that they, this week, just announced SPR Pathfinder. The beauty of this is that uh, you can get a metal part that, say, is quite complex, has a lot of internal channels, uh, and then be able to automate the powder removal. Now, of course, if you think about producing something very simple, let's say a cup, and you've built that, how are you going to remove the powder? Oh, very easy. You just tip it upside down, shake it about, and then you're done. No problems. But what happens when you're using 3D printing, of course, you're producing these really um, complex uh, structures. And it's becoming increasingly harder to remove powder from those parts. If we think about a rocket engine, for example, and the things that we can do with additive manufacturing with a rocket engine, but the amount of internal channels that, say, might, in a very simple case, let's say you go up and then down, it's no longer good enough to just turn a part upside down and remove the powder, because, of course, there's still powder entrapped. So what Solucon does is have um, all of the part geometry within the software and is able to assess that part geometry and then develop a, um, a path, a, a tool, like essentially a toolpath, um, for how they're going to remove that powder in order to ensure complete removal. So I really liked what they had to offer. They did launch their company with the intention of this product, but now the product is actually av av available. Post-process and EOS also had an announcement around post-processing, um, but more particularly around automating the workflow of post-processing. Automation was a huge theme, and, and to me, automation and post-processing just go hand in hand. Um, you need to have automation connected to your post-processing in order for it to be seamless and much, much less painful. And that's the other thing as well I should mention, is that software then needs to come in to support that. So you need software to come in and um, be able to accurately provide that digital twin of your part from the time it is built to the time it leaves your factory. And as much as we all love to think about and talk about 3D printing, the reality is a good two thirds or more of your part in your factory is concerned with post-processing. It's going to be doing a lot more time doing post-processing, whatever that is and whatever that looks like, and whether it's metals or whether it's polymers, it doesn't matter. Um, but being able to have software that can properly track that process flow is becoming increasingly important. Um, and we're definitely seeing some really interesting uh, software providers out there. Authentize, uh, I believe, is just over there. Um, and has launched uh, now with a number of different partners. Excuse me. Um, and we also have, uh, again, on the startup booth, Magnitude. Um, Matt was here uh, earlier this week presenting. Um, that's around business excellence and op operational excellence um, and optimization, being able to ensure that you're getting the most out of your machine. And again, this is all really oriented towards serial production. So what we're seeing is that the industry is maturing, is definitely moving towards scale. Um, this is something that we've been seeing happen for a number of years now. Like I said, it was about 2019 where we saw this huge deluge of post-processing providers coming and exhibiting at Formnext. And that means that we are heading towards industrialization. And I'm going to talk about investment and why that's really important, but not right now. <laughs> I'm going to save that for, for later. The other one was big machines, big builds, big parts. Every time I go and talk to someone who has been at the show all week, and I say, what were some of the resounding themes for you? What, what are you really noticing as a really big technology move or change or difference? Um, and it, almost everyone has said big parts, big machines. I thought it was really interesting that uh, we had SLM Solutions um, actually during the pandemic release their NXG12 laser system. 
Um, 12 lasers is currently the maximum number of lasers that we have in a metal machine that's commercially available. Um, and and it's, a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal achievement, being able to put 12 lasers into a machine. Their build volume now just announced um, <clears throat> in the last week or so, a collaboration with CTC, um, an organization that does development work for the Army. They really wanted to see a much longer or, sorry, deeper Z axis. So their uh, NXG now is being extended to 1.5 meters, which is providing a very big build volume. And if you go to the booth, you'll see that they had some beautiful parts on display to showcase that build volume. Another one is E plus 3D. They're, interestingly, they're a Chinese provider. Um, so a Chinese German company. Uh, their build volume is maxing out at nearly two meters. So that's a 1.358 by 1.358 um, uh, by, I, I believe it's about 1.4 uh, meters. So that's a, that's a really big cubic volume um, and definitely a competitor to SLM Solutions. They've got nine lasers in their system. And then, of course, this week, SLM Solutions came in again and announced an even bigger system. So again, this one is uh, much wider in the, in the X and the Y. Um, so I thought that that was kind of interesting because previously they've always tended to scale in the Z, um, but this is now scaling in the X and the Y. DED is another really big theme, I think, that's coming out in additive generally, and we definitely saw this here this week. Um, an increasing number of DED providers and exhibitors. DED is really interesting to me because um, a lot of, so when I say DED, sorry, I mean directed energy deposition. So that means um, that you are consolidating material. Uh, usually it can be blown powder or it could be a wire um, with a heat source. And the heat source could be a laser, it could be an arc. Um, and a lot of our DED knowledge really comes out of conventional manufacturing. So welding, for example, is hugely relevant to technologies in the DED space. We have a lot of welding capability. We have a lot of welding knowledge. So to me, it was always very interesting, um, but also a little confounding as to why we weren't seeing more DED in the market much earlier. What's interesting to me is that laser powder bed fusion matured um, over the has matured over the last 10 years really, really nicely um, and, and, and actually quite extraordinarily um, in, in terms of the innovations that you see today. But DED tended to lag a lot and it only in terms of market share was a small amount of the market share. But I think what we're going to see is we're going to see DED increase. And in fact, if you just go down, just down there, just, <coughs> just across the hall here, you see WAM 3D, again, another first time exhibitor. Um, and they're, they're using a, a, a WAM system, so wire and arc additive manufacturing, um, and produce a beautiful turnkey solution. Um, and so that's the other thing that we see happening. So for example, with DED, you tend to just jimmy together this, that, and the next thing. You'd have to do that yourself. Being able to provide, some, provide something that is a turnkey solution makes it eminently more accessible and easier to use um, and easier to adopt, quite frankly. I think I did mention I was going to talk about investment. Um, so in 2021, and I know that this isn't necessarily what we're seeing here this week, um, but we're definitely seeing the impacts of it here this week. Um, and also, we see the impacts of it in the technology space. Um, if we can't grow something, we can't mature something, we can't develop something, a technology, if we don't have the investment to support it. So in 2021, we saw a whole host of 3D printing companies list on the public market, usually via what's called a SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company, uh, which otherwise known as a backdoor listing, um, and being able to raise very large sums of money. There was really this run on SPACs all through 2021, and that's come to a pretty abrupt end um, as the market conditions and the economic climate has completely changed in 2022. This is having a pretty interesting impact on 3D printing companies. Um, a lot of the companies that you see here today uh, tend to have no more 
than about two years' worth of runway in terms of their cash flow. Um, so not going to be able to see themselves outside of two years. So having said that, um, you know, you can always say, oh, you're not going to last, you know, for another two years. But of course, you make more sales, you cut more costs, you innovate more, and you live to see another day. Um, I was speaking, though, to the investment banking community a lot this week. And one of the comments that came through was not so much around acquisitions being so popular um, as they have been in the past, uh, but perhaps more looking around mergers and seeing um, an increased number of mergers happening. I think that uh, it, 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 it would be interesting to see what happens in the next two years. We, we really, in terms of 2022, and I mentioned that there was changing economic conditions, um, have seen a very big shift away from growth opportunities into profitability opportunities. This is making a very big impact. Any of the CEOs that you'll find on any of the booths around here are becoming acutely aware of this issue of profitability. Now, what's the impact on 3D printing? Well, 3D printing is essentially, it's a growth technology. That's why investment bankers are interested in 3D printing, because it's a growth market for them. Um, growth, growth markets, are becoming less popular to invest in, in these economic conditions, which are looked to, to, to continue, by the way, for the next kind of about three years. Um, so instead, what we're doing is now much more focusing on profitability. So a lot of the companies in, 3D printing, in the 3D printing space are very much surviving off the fact that they are growth businesses, not necessarily profitable businesses. And so what we will be seeing, I believe, um, and have seen this week, but will increasingly see through the course of the next two years, um, is a real increase on profitability. And what does that mean? It means more revenue, of course, but it also means significant cost cutting. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, I mean, I've worked a lot in the R&D space, and it usually means that R&D tends to take a bit of a dive. Um, so companies are much less focused on what they'll be uh, innovating on, and they're a lot more focused on what they're trying to sell. So innovation, I think we might see that tend to sort of plateau a little bit. Um, I know I'm doing show summary uh, at the moment, but I am also doing a few forward-looking statements, and I hope that that's OK. Um, but back to the show, I think the other thing that we really saw come through pretty strongly is this post-pandemic world, if I can call it that. Um, I see Sasha over there. I had a meeting with him uh, just this week, and he made a beautiful statement. He said, uh, the AM community is a hugging community, <laughs> which, I thought, which I thought was a lovely thing to say, and it's certainly my experience. Um, hugs are back in fashion, I guess. Uh, and on the first day when I came into the show, someone said to me, Alex, how many hugs do you think you're going to be giving out this week? So there was a lot of hugs going on, going on which was lovely. Um, we are definitely a community, and this is our opportunity. This show, Form Next, is our opportunity to all come together. And it's lovely to see everyone. The other thing about the show this week is that um, the Form Next show is now back to pretty much pre-pandemic levels. So um, getting very close in terms of floor space and numbers of, in, numbers of in, in exhibitors um, to what they were in 2019. However, so just pretty close to 2019, but we are missing all of our Chinese exhibitors and we are missing all of our Russian exhibitors for, for reasons that I'm sure you're all aware of. Uh, but if we had Russian and Chinese exhibitors here, you would see an increase on your 2019 numbers. So it's safe to say um, that we are back into full swing. I was really lucky to uh, go and see a fantastic um, presentation by a guy called Chris Connery, um, who works for Context World. Context World gets data from all around the world on shipment, mainly on ship their shipments of printers, OK? So their shipment data is incredible. But what they've been able to do is calculate that through to revenue. So Chris put up a number of different slides um, at the TCT conference and talked about all the shipments that we're seeing in the last number of quarters from 2019 to now, 
And what we saw is a 40% increase in total revenue in the 3D printing industry. 40% growth from 2019, and 56% of that was from industrial machines. Um, and of the 56%, it's Metal AM that's really driving the growth. Um, and I mentioned DED and laser powder bed fusion. That mix is changing slightly. So we're seeing that while laser powder bed Laser powder bed fusion is certainly growing in revenue and in market size. Um, it's growing in line with the rest of the, um, the, the market growth of 3D printing in, in total, but its total share of the market is decreasing. Interesting data point, I think. Finally, uh, Formnext is a wonderful time, like I said, to be coming together and to have great parties. So we had the Formnext party last night. Um, which was a huge celebration. And again, I think, like I said, this was this really looking to 3D printing being in the post-pandemic world. Um, so it's lovely to see that we can get together and celebrate in this way. Um, it's my thanks go to Masago for putting on such an incredible show. This really is the world's premier 3D printing event. Um, and what I think is, is, is interesting is that despite the fact that we've got shows and of various different guises in 3D printing all around the world, Formnext remains the number one show to get to every single year for anyone in the 3D printing industry. So on that note, um, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope you all have a wonderful west rest of your day and safe travels home. Thank you so much, thank Alex. Thank you, Alex, please. Alex, let me start with a compliment, if I'm allowed to, uh, because, I mean, a, as you started your speech with, you, you apologized for your voice, because we are all <laughs> kind of exhausted. You just mentioned the parties at the very end. Yeah. We all have been yesterday at this wonderful, big, large party, and uh, we kicked off with Dimension. So we had, uh, beside the exhibition, we had some, let's call it, in a positive way, stressful hours uh, behind us. So. Uh, Coming back to my compliment, after four days full impact, and I can imagine in your role and what you presented to us, you had like tons of conversations, speeches, etc. behind you. This was so inspiring, was so much fun to listen to you. And uh, you, you did something great to me because a, as I was moderating all time here over the four days, I hadn't had the chance to, no, that was not a con that was not fishing for compliment, by the way. I just wanted to say, I never had the chance to went out and uh, visit the exhibitors and you gave me a perfect overview over the whole exhibition. Thank you for that. But let me ask some critical question, if I'm allowed to. Starting with sustainability, uh, you mentioned. I remember last year I talked to Sherry as well at AMGTA, and she was telling me how difficult it is to do these LCAs. Uh, I heard this very often uh, during the speeches we had here or panel discussions. Um, how do you see these, these LCA trend? Is it realistic? Is it... Um, is it true? Don't get me wrong. Are all these LCAs true? Are they considering everything that needs to be considered? Um, how was it for you and your, your, what was your perception on all these LCAs? Yeah, well, um, I, I gave you a small clap, by the way, because being here for four days and moderating on the stage, that's, uh, that's, that's, an, uh, that's a phenomenal job. So well done to you, because you're nearly <laughs> you, at the you. end of your, of yeah. your week here. Um, so. Uh, an LCA, it's a life cycle assessment. Now, the issue is, is that too often we, can, we, we uh, might do an LCA study and pick and choose what part of the life cycle gets assessed, and that's not the correct way to do a life cycle assessment. Um, when I spoke to Metal Powder Works, and I mentioned that um, they said, oh, well, you know, we, we, had an, we had a life cycle assessment done, um, and our process is 90%, you know, less carbon footprint than conventional powder manufacturing. Um, and my first question was, oh, did you do that yourself, or did you get someone else to do that for you? Um, and they said, no, you know, we got someone else to do that for us. Um, they're a, a, you know, a well-known and recognized um, outfit that do, do life cycle assessments. So, I mean, of course, if you're paying someone to do a life cycle assessment, yeah, yeah, there's always a small conflict there. Um, but having said that, really the provider, if they have any integrity, you know, and that's where reputation becomes so important, right, um, is going to do a very truthful and very honest assessment and do a life cycle assessment. So it really has to be from beginning to end. And when I say end, it's not when the part 
leaves the factory, for example, it's when that part sees the end of its life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so very important. And I mean, you know, again, I talked about 6K. Um, they're doing a, an, a life cycle assessment with Fraunhofer. I mean, Fraunhofer is an incredibly well-respected institution. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that forming those sorts of partnerships, um, doing the life cycle assessment with a very reputable provider is very important. Um, and back to Metal Powder Works, one of the comments that was made was uh, they looked at another part of um, what they were doing and they asked um, this same provider to do a life cycle assessment and they said, we actually felt that the results were a little bit too good to be true and we asked them to go back and, and have another comb through, you know, because we were concerned that they were missing data, that they, they, yeah. you know, they shouldn't have been, they, should, they hadn't captured. Um, and I thought that that was a really good comment, actually. Um, you know, sometimes you can get that sustainability story that's a bit too good to be true. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, and, and you know, the AMGTA play a really important role in being able to facilitate these studies and ensure that there is in integrity in the process. And one of the things I mentioned to Sherry was it would be really nice if, if the AMGTA um, could put out something like a, a, a handbook just to explain, Absolutely. you know, what, yeah. what a life cycle assessment is and what's the correct methodology um, and really how you should be um, uh, putting that study together. So. Probably already on their agenda. They're not that old, so uh, probably coming next. Another interesting topic, and, and we discussed it several times, and you combine two things, and I found that very interesting. Uh, we were talking about the topic of post-processing and automation, that this was a big topic here on the, mm. uh, on the exhibition. Then you um, tackled the topic of investments and how that is changing now from focus on growth companies to more probability and uh, realization of, uh, invest of, of uh, revenues, etc. Yeah. And it is interesting because we, we discuss so often this topic of automation. Would that be not rather a positive trend to put more focus on probability and creating revenues, but this would force the companies to put more focus on more automation and more post-processing. Would that not be a very good, uh, let's put it, uh, core... Um, outcome. Yeah, core outcome. Yeah. That would be much better because, yeah. I mean, we are talking, all, because you mentioned R&D and we're talking all the time about innovation trends, but at a certain time, you need to streamline things <laughs> and get things yeah, better. Don't true. get me wrong. I no, mean, put, a, put, a, yeah. put focus on the process and be more economic scale and not only uh, innovation scale. So yeah. how do you see that? Yeah, no, no, I think that's a really good point. And actually, one of the things I, wanted, I meant to, to, to mention was what we're seeing a lot more is um, customer testimonials. Um, and so you've got, you know, generally speaking, you'll have a, a press release about something, and then you'll have that company says, for example, we're releasing a new machine, and then they'll say, um, they'll have a quote in there from one of their customers, you know, say one of their, you know, their beta testers that says, you know, we've been using this and this is what we're using it for, and you know, this is why it's really important or helpful for us in our business. Um, the, the reason I mention this is because we were talking about you know, growth versus profitability, um, and, and I think that this increasing drive towards profitability, um, the, what's coming out of that is, is things like customer testimonials. So it's no longer, it used to be, it was just like, let's launch a machine, out. You know, push yeah, it yeah, out, yeah, push yeah. it out. But no now, no matter what kind of application is behind it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now, um, I think a lot of the OEMs are now um, doing a very hard pivot on that idea, um, and doing, in, in fact, the reverse. So really holding off on launching a machine. You know, HP's Metal Jet was in development for a number of years. You know, with um, with be their beta um, testers mm. and customers. Um, so, you know, but again, sorry, back to the post-processing. Yep, no, you're absolutely correct. You know, we, we've got, uh, we've always been, I think we've been talking about it for a couple of years around, you know, serial production and, and so on in AM. Um, but I think with uh, the change in market conditions now um, and this increased focus on profitability, we are going to really see um, a shift uh, and a trend towards production because, um, you know, Companies here now are being assessed um, compared to other much more profitable companies, mm -hmm. but from investment bankers. They're now being put on the same playing field, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah, as much as we're an emerging technology, um, it's, it's very much time to, to be pushed towards being much more commercial.
Absolutely. And uh, as I'm more from the commercial part, I would say this is probably the more sustainable way of developing our industry. Correct. Instead of just focusing on new innovation, new technologies, etc. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and the other thing I think as well is um, customer funded development. Right. So so rather than um, you know raising money and spending that money on um, on innovation, it's going to be much more around. Oh, hello, customer A. You know, you said you really wanted a machine that can do X, Y, and Z. Let's put a program together where you fund that development. Yeah. You know, and we, we will strike some deal around the outcome of that. Um, so I think that we will see a lot more of that, and that's a really good thing. You know, we should be having um, products developed that are being informed by the, the end users. Uh, market oriented, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. So we're running out of time. I, I could tell you, Alex, we can keep on talking. Let's skip the <laughs> next point. No, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Thank you so much for being our guest. It was impressive. I learned a lot, and, and that's the main thing. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, and good luck for the future. Okay, see you next time. Okay? You too, Sven. Thank you bye so bye. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Alex Kingsbury, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let, let me be honest, okay? The following announcement is naturally the hardest for me because we are slowly coming to the end of Formnext 2022. The nice thing from my side is that it's not the end, actually, because in a moment I will be visiting my colleague Frank Jablonski in the afterwork talk, and we will be welcoming to very very important guest at the last highlight, and you should not miss that. Before that, we have another highlight block for you. Please do not miss the next show. Four minutes to go. See you there.